All right, sorry about that. I think I might have the audio working for you now. And starting with the CDL air brakes and getting your air brake ticket for the purposes of getting a commercial driver's license. All right, sorry about that. I think I might have the audio working for you now. And perfect, awesome. So air brakes, without further ado, getting started here. What I was saying previously about air brakes is that most of these jurisdictions in North America, because you're required to get an air brake ticket to drive a commercial vehicle and as well a RV unit in the United States and in Canada, if it has a four-sided yellow button on the dash, it's going to be an air brake unit and you need to get an air brake ticket. The problem with these air brake courses is that they're 40 years old. They devised these courses in the 1970s and unfortunately they have not been revisited and amended and you're just not going to find manual slack adjusters on an air brake system. You're not going to find a single circuit system. It's all dual air brake system. It's all automatic slack adjusters and it's there aren't any wigwags. All the low air warnings on an air brake system in this day and age are all going to be a light and a buzzer. So what I'm going to do today is talk to you about air brakes. Mostly what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, the pre-trip inspection that you have to do for the purposes of getting your license. And for those of you who are going to truck driving school or getting your bus license, school buses as well, you're going to go to a school, you're going to do a uh, a pre-trip inspection and you're going to have to do a practical component of that which is you're going to have to inspect the air brakes make sure that the air brakes are in adjustment and make sure that all the components are working the in cab portion of the pre-trip inspection is probably the most difficult because it's pure memorization but there's essentially in any jurisdiction that you're going to be taking a pre-trip inspection for the purposes of getting your air brakes there's five basic tests that you have to do in the test and the are in the cab rather of the vehicle whether it's a bus it's a truck or it's an rv unit and those five tests are you have to test the governor the minimum and maximum settings of the governor you have to test the low air warning make sure that the brakes come on between 20 and 45 pounds per square inch you have to test that the compressor builds a prescribed amount of air in a set time most of that time it's going to be uh, 50 to 90 pounds per square inch in three minutes at a high idle, which is about a thousand RPM on a diesel engine. And then uh, you're gonna do a leak test and the last two tests of your pre-trip inspection are gonna be a service response test on the service brakes and you're gonna test the parking brakes. You're gonna do a tug test on the parking brakes. So what I'm gonna do here is get on with the presentation uh, for the PowerPoints and I'll just go through that quickly. So a little bit of bonus material, downhill braking, you're going to use engine, uh, your engine brakes in this day and age. Engine brake technology is really, really good and it's uh, not likely that you're going to have to use your service brakes. If you're in the right gear going downhill, you're not going to have to use the service brakes. So you just have to get in the right gear before you go down over the top of the hill. Now if you're driving a big truck, 13 and 18 speed, you're going to be in 5 low if you're driving tandem tandem, so it's an 18 wheeler and you're running 80,000 pounds, if you're in five low, you're gonna be able to go down the hill. If you do need to make service brake applications, if you're driving a pickup truck or an RV unit or something like that, hard, short, intermittent brake applications. That way, if you let off the service brakes, you are going to be able to allow air to pass over the drums or the disc brakes and allow them to cool. Grade signs. Pay attention to grade signs on long downhill grades, especially if you're in the Rocky Mountains, for those of us on the west coast of North America. If it's less than one kilometer or one mile and the grade is less than 10%, you just use your service brakes. If it's more than a mile, more than a kilometer, and it's greater or it's greater than 10%, then you need to gear down and start preparing to go down that long downhill. Now, uh, most grade signs are in percentage, so this one here, you can't really see it in the image that well, is 7%, but uh, seven percent is uh, for every one kilometer it goes forward it goes drops 70 meters or if you're in feet uh, for every hundred feet you go forward the hill drops seven feet so that's how you read a grade sign so I'm Rick August uh, I'm the founder and <laughs> driving instructor the chief driving instructor of smart drive test as you're on my YouTube channel you can see there's lots of good information here about not only air brakes getting a commercial license but also for those uh, drivers getting a new license so that's smart drive test and as well for those of you getting a commercial license most of the information on the YouTube channel uh, the class 5 stuff the car and light truck stuff is fair game for getting a higher commercial license so 
Make sure you pay attention to the other uh, information as well and for the purposes of getting a license. You know, you have to know where to stop in traffic and uh, all of the road rules apply, how to make a left-hand turn, how to make a right-hand turn, all of those rules are going to apply on a, a commercial driver's license. So pay attention to the class five stuff as well. Uh, so large commercial vehicles, uh, stopping distance, take note on your driver's test that if they ask you what stopping distance is or total stopping distance is, there's a difference between those two things. Stopping distance is uh, the time that you put your foot on the brake pedal till the vehicle comes to a stop. Total stopping distance, as you can see here in the slide, is driver's perception time, reaction time, brake lag time. Uh, braking distance time equals total stopping distance. So just on your driver's test, take note of that and make sure you look at those key words. Uh, and of course, all of this in a, in a large vehicle, whether it's an RV unit, a bus, or a truck, is going to depend on the ability of the brake linings to produce friction and the brake drums to dissipate the heat and the tires to have traction on the roadway. Speed and weight factors, and this is in Canada at least. I haven't seen this question in the U.S., but I have seen it in Canada. Uh, to, if you increase the speed of the vehicle, if you double the speed of the vehicle, it requires four times the stopping power to stop the vehicle, as you can see here in the image. Uh, so speed, twice the speed, four times. So the way that you remember this, the mnemonic on this is two weight, four speed. So it's two times the braking power if you double the weight. It's four times the braking power if you double the speed. And if you put the two of them together, you're going to need eight times the stopping power. So if you double the speed and double the weight, you're going to need eight times the stopping power to bring the vehicle to a stop. And in large commercial vehicles with air brakes, uh, undo a care and inattention, and of course in this day and age it's going to be distracted driving, unsafe speeds are the top two factors assigned to commercial drivers being involved in police reported casualties. And it's kind of a catch-all. It doesn't really give you a whole lot of detail of exactly why commercial vehicles are involved in police reported casualties. So greater stopping distance, obviously if you're driving a larger commercial vehicle that has more weight, it's going to take longer for you to stop that vehicle. Higher speeds require more stopping power. Trucks require more space to stop. Therefore, you have to, to compensate for that. One of the ways that you do that is scan farther ahead down the road and you brake earlier. And of course, with the large commercial vehicle slopes and grades are going to become a factor as well. In a large commercial vehicle and as well in a car and a light truck, when you're braking, you're gonna to come to a defensive stop. So you come to a complete stop. Just before you come to a complete stop, you let up on the brake pedal, allow the body to settle back over the chassis because all vehicles are comprised of two part, which is the chassis and the body. And if you hold the brakes down until the vehicle comes to a complete stop, the body slingshots back over the chassis and <laughs> gives you a bit of whiplash. And again, there's a video here on the channel as well about how to know if your vehicle has come to a complete stop. And so, as I said, this applies to all vehicles, not just commercial vehicles. Downgrades, most overheated brakes on a downgrade result from poor braking techniques. And an 18% grade, as you can see there in the sign, is an incredibly steep grade. And you want one or two gears lower to go down the hill than you did used to climb the hill. Now, as I said in BC here, British Columbia and on the west coast of the United States, in the Rocky Mountains, uh, in Virginia and other places that have mountains, a lot of times you're not going to go up a hill to go down a hill. So if you're driving a 13 or 18 speed, you need to know that uh, you want it in five low if you're driving tandem tandem at a legal weight. If you're running heavier than that or you have an automatic transmission, you want to get down into a really low gear. And as again, when it comes to descending downgrades, you can go down the hill a thousand times too slow, but it, the one time you go down too fast, maybe you're last. So until you get used to the vehicle, until you get used to the hill, just go down too slow. Now, CDL air brake courses, one of the things that they don't talk about is they don't talk a lot, a lot about signs specifically directed to large commercial vehicles. And here in British Columbia, where I live, uh, these signs with the dashed borders are specifically for commercial vehicles. And these are regulatory signs. So if you have a brake check, uh, where trucks have to pull in or large commercial vehicles, you have to pull in and you have to do a brake check. 
So some of these are regulatory signs, and as we know, uh, rectangle signs with the white background with black writing on them or symbols are regulatory signs, which uh, the root word of regulatory is regulation, which means that you have to stop. The other ones are advisory signs, 30 kilometers an hour. Now, most of these times, if you have a hill that has a, an, a, a cautionary sign of 30 kilometers an hour, you want to make sure that you're doing 30 kilometers an hour when you're going down the hill. A good practice if you're doing less than 60 kilometers an hour on an 80 kilometer an hour or above highway, you want to activate your four ways to indicate to other traffic that you are going slow. So in the states that would be 40 miles an hour. If you're doing less than 40 miles an hour, you want to activate your four way flashers to indicate to other traffic that you are in fact going slow. And this is very true in this day and age of improved technology of engine brakes and whatnot. If you're in the right gear before you start down over the top of the hill and have your engine brake on full, uh, you should be able to go down the hill without relying on your service brakes. So just talking a little bit about pre-trip inspection, inspecting air brake components. Uh, so for purposes of securing your vehicle, you need to secure the vehicle first by putting in wheel chocks, uh, which are basically blocks to secure the vehicle against inadvertent movement because you do need to release the parking brakes to check air brake adjustment and you're going to do functional checks of the air brake system. When you're actually physically checking air brake components on the vehicle, secure, not damaged and not leaking is going to be your mantra because about 75% of the components on the vehicle either have fluid or air in them. So you're going to say that secure, not damaged, not leaking. Safety first, as I said, secure the vehicle. Uh, make sure that you have wheel chocks in. You're going to build the system air pressure over 100 pounds and you're going to locate the wet tank. If you have an older vehicle that doesn't have an ADIS system, ADIS stands for Air Dryer Integrated System. These newer air brake systems do not have a wet tank, but if you do have a, an older air brake system, probably uh, earlier than 2010, it's going to have an older system on it. It's going to have a wet tank. And it, so it will have three tanks. It'll have a wet tank, a primary tank, and a secondary tank. And to locate the wet tank on the vehicle, you go in the cab, take note of what the air pressure gauges read, and then go out and start draining tanks. And the one tank that doesn't drop the needles on the, on the dash, that's going to be your wet tank. So you want to drain the wet tank completely. And the reason for draining the wet tank completely on the system is to check the one-way check valves at the entrance to the primary and secondary tanks because these two valves, the, these two one-way check valves, are primarily responsible for the division of the system into a primary and secondary subsystem. Draining air tanks, the question on the test, the CDL test is how often do you drain wet tanks or how often do you drain the air tanks on your vehicle? You drain the tanks every day. That's the answer to the question on the test regardless of where you are in North America or the world. Drain air tanks every day. So uh, draining air tanks, ensure the pressure is within normal operating range and shut off the vehicle. Uh, we already went over all that. Drain all the tanks. So that was basically what it was. Inspecting air brake components, secure, not damaged, not leaking. You're looking for broken components, frays, wears, those types of things. You want to be testing all of the foundation brake components. And for most of the jurisdictions in North America, you're going to be doing the pry bar method. And the pry bar method is simply to put a pry bar in at the clevis pin and pull out and do a pry bar method or sometimes called the free stroke. And essentially it shouldn't come out of the brake chamber. The push rod shouldn't come out of the brake chamber more than the width of your thumb. In most states in the US, it's an inch, but the width of your thumb is approximately half to, half to three quarters of an inch, which is going to tell you that it's within adjustment. Brake chambers on an air brake equipped vehicle are the primary component. They are the components that convert air pressure into strong mechanical force. Uh, you want to make sure that the size of the brake chambers, <coughs> excuse me, match across the axles. Uh, the push rods attach to the same hole on both sides of the axle and they're secure and no visible damage. Brake drums and rotors secure, no damage, round and without irregular wear airlines and tubing, no wearing, structural damage, secured, not hanging down, and air tanks, secure, no damage, and no audible leaks. And because you have the wheels chalked and you have the parking brakes release on the system, there is air in the system. So as you're going around the unit, you're going to be able to listen for air leaks. All of the compressors, uh, most of the manuals will tell you that compressors are either uh, belt driven or gear driven. 
in this day and age, they're all gear driven. They're bolted right to the side of the engine. Uh, they're, you're not going to find any that are belt driven. It just doesn't happen in this day and age. Secure no damage. There's no oil leaks. The compressor is truly parasitic. It takes power from the motor. It uses the motor's filtration system to draw air in. It uses the engine's lubrication system. So make sure there's no leaks. And if there are belts in the odd case that you're checking, doing a pre-trip inspection on a pre-1980 vehicle, it might have uh, belts, but just make sure they're good uh, good nick they're not frayed or damaged and they have proper tension the governor testing governor settings so think of the governor on an air compressor like a thermostat on a furnace in your house it runs within a temperature a minimum and a maximum pressure rather so the engine's running ensure the parking brake is released and the governor should restart the compressor uh, above 80 pounds per square inch we don't use kilopascals in north america in north america we use pounds per square inch so that is one of your in-cab checks is to test the governor setting. You're going to test the minimum setting first because you're going to pump down. And what I'll do after the presentation is when I put the description down, I'll put a link to my website and there is an infograph that will show you how to do the in-cab checks and what you have to do. So after you do the minimum setting, you pump down to above 80 pounds, throttle up, make sure that the knees are rising. Therefore, you know that the uh, governor has put the compressor back into the load phase or the cut in phase as it's sometimes called then you're going to continue to pump down to 60 pounds per square inch uh, some states some jurisdictions some provinces want 55 or above it's mostly 60 pounds per square inch that the low air warning will activate on older trucks it'll be a wigwag but as i said they, <laughs> they haven't been around for 30 years uh, i think what happened was is that the wigwag dropped down behind the visor and uh scared the living daylights out of a couple of drivers and they drove off the road and crashed into a tree and died in a fiery inferno so they went eh, you know maybe a light and a buzzer ain't such a good are is such a, is a much better idea so we don't have wigwags anymore so the lower warning should come on at 60 pounds per square inch and on many vehicles on buses they're going to come on well above 60 sometimes they'll come on as high as 80 so uh low air warning just fan the brakes down until uh the low air warning comes on Testing air pressure buildup. So in many states, you're gonna pump down to make sure that the spring brakes activate after you check the low air warning and simply you're just gonna pump down between 20 and 45 pounds per square inch and the buttons on the dash will pop out activating the spring brakes, which are the parking brakes on the unit. Testing pressure buildup. So after you do that, then you're gonna throttle up, get your timer out. When the first needle hits 50, you're going to start timing when the second needle gets to 90 then you'll stop timing on the way up the low air warning is going to go out and you'll say to the examiner when you're doing your cdl test the low air warning has gone out and the system built 50 to 90 well within three minutes essentially what you're saying to the examiner is that you tell them what the parameters of the test are and tell them that they passed the test that's all you need to do then you're going to build to maximum pressure so we'll just go back to this one here building the compressor so when you get to 90 you're going to release the parking brakes again and then you're going to build to maximum pressure and the way that you know that the system is at maximum pressure the air dryer will purge and you'll check at the needles and say the needles have stopped climbing therefore the uh the, com the governor has put the compressor into the unload phase or the cutout phase and therefore I know the system is at maximum pressure and the governor is working. Then you're gonna shut the truck off and you're gonna do a leak test. On a single unit, you're allowed three pounds. On a track, truck and trailer, you're allowed to lose four pounds. On a truck with two or more trailers, you're allowed to lose six pounds. So essentially you just build it up to maximum pressure, shut the engine off, make a full service brake application and hold for one minute. After the initial drop, you're not allowed to lose three pounds, four pounds on a truck and trailer and six pounds on a truck with more than one trailer then the final tests for your air brake pre-trip inspection are testing vehicle spring brakes so you simply apply the parking brakes put it in a low gear make sure you got over 90 pounds and then try and move the vehicle forward if it doesn't move forward then you know that the spring brakes are working and then the last piece is to release the parking brakes roll it ahead a few feet and apply the service brakes and make sure that the service brakes bring the vehicle to a stop and that they also release because it's a response test to make sure that the service brakes apply and release. So then you'll apply the brakes on your unit and fill out your pre-trip inspection because all commercial drivers have to fill out a pre-trip inspection form as part and parcel of their job and you have to fill out a pre-trip inspection form every day. 
So those, that's this quick presentation. If you have any questions at all, just leave them in the notes here and I'll be more than happy to answer questions for you about getting uh, air brakes for the purposes of getting a CDL license. And we'll just put in here, So air brakes, basically for those of you uh, working towards getting a CDL license and doing air brakes, you're gonna find air brakes on tractor trailer units, you're gonna find them on five ton trucks, you're gonna find them on some RV units and definitely on school buses. So if you're driving any of those units, you're going to end up having air brakes on the vehicle and you're going to have to be knowledgeable about air brakes and know about air brakes and how air brakes work. Now the other thing you need to know about air brakes, which is just a little bit different than hydraulic systems, is that if you pump the brakes on an air brake system, you're going to lower the air pressure in the unit because after you make a brake application on an air brake equipped vehicle, what happens is, is the air is exhausted from the system via the quick release valve and the quick release valve reduces brake lag because there's a slight delay from the time you put your foot on the brake pedal to the time that the brakes activate and vice versa. So essentially what happens is, is to reduce brake lag in the system, air is exhausted from the air brake system into the atmosphere. So if you pump the brake on an air brake system, you're gonna lower system pressure. And if you do it enough, <laughs> eventually you're not gonna have any brakes. So you wanna make sure that uh, you don't pump the brakes. You simply hold down and make a firm brake application on an air brake equipped vehicle. And I've had students do that going down hills. Not very often, but once in a while, they'll pump the brake and they'll lower the air brake pressure. And if you're going down a long, steep downgrade, then what's going to happen is you're going to end up without brakes. So you can't do that on an air brake system. It's the difference between an air brake system and a hydraulic system. Now, the other piece that I'll say about air brake system is, is unfortunately, we make air brake systems very complicated and they're not that complicated. They're, very, they're really not that much different than the brakes that you find in your car or light truck. Essentially, in your car or light truck, you have a service brake, which is essentially the brake pedal. You push down on the brake pedal and the vehicle comes to a nice gentle stop. And it's the same thing in an air brake equipped vehicle. You push down and you release the parking brakes, push down on the brake pedal when you're coming up to a traffic light or whatnot, and the vehicle comes to a gentle stop. It's exactly the same as what happens in your vehicle. The other piece about air brake systems is they have parking brakes and you need to apply the parking brakes every time you get out of the vehicle on your car or light truck, you also have a parking brake. And, but instead of using spring pressure, which is what they use on air brake systems, it, you use your arm or you use your foot. You click, 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 it's, it's a ratchet. So you apply the parking brakes. And you know, for some people who get in big trucks, it's a bit odd because you get to put the parking brakes on every time you stop the vehicle to get out of it. And you should get in that habit in your personal vehicle as well, just saying. And the final piece about your personal vehicle is if you br lose your brakes on your personal vehicle, you can use that parking brake as an emergency brake. You can pull that up and it will activate the brakes. It's the same thing on a big truck or a bus or an RV unit that has air brakes on it. If you lose air pressure in that system, those spring brakes can no longer be held off because there's no air pressure and those will activate automatically and the, and the vehicle will come to a stop. So you're not gonna lose, uh, you're not gonna lose, the brakes won't fail in an air brake system. There are too many fail safes and there's a video here on my channel called Air Brakes Won't Fail and it'll go through all of the fail safes in an air brake system that will show you that in fact it will not fail. In this day and age, uh, air brake systems are almost bulletproof and it's this, and one of the main fail safes of an air brake system is the dual air brake system. The system is divided into two independent subsystems. So if one system fails, one side fails, the other system will continue to work normally. And it's the same on your car or light truck. If you go in under the hood of your vehicle, open the hood up and right in front of the steering wheel on what's called the firewall, you'll find the master cylinder. If you take the lid off the master cylinder and look inside, there's two chambers in there. One's for the front brakes and one's for the rear brakes. So if one system fails, the other will continue to work normally. You will not lose your braking system because uh, it's two independent subsystems. So an air brake system is exactly the same, more or less, on your as what's on your light truck or, or car. The system will not fail. And 
There was one more piece that I wanted to say about that. Yes, the other piece about it is, is yes, all of these things are the same. You have service brakes, you have parking brakes, you have emergency brakes on both a hydraulic system and an air brake system. The only difference on an air brake system is the power source. So you have air pressure to operate the service brakes and you have large powerful springs to operate the parking brakes and the emergency brakes. So the only difference between a hydraulic braking system and an air brake system is the power source. Otherwise, the two systems are almost identical. The way that they operate is a little bit different, but for the most part, they work fundamentally the same. And it's a little weird in the beginning, but for the most part, uh, as I said at the, at the outset of the live stream here, uh, the problem with parking brake or the, the, the problem with air brake systems is, is that the course is designed to teach you about air brake systems were designed in the 1970s and air brake systems have evolved and they just simply won't fail in this day and age. The last failing of an air brake system was the manual slack adjusters because drivers had to get under the vehicle and actually physically manually adjust the brakes on an air brake system. Well, in the mid 1990s, they came up with automatic slack adjusters and they were made that they had to be fitted on all new vehicles manufactured after 1996. And it's just, it's nigh impossible. You're gonna find manual slack adjusters in this day and age on an air brake system. So that's a quick overview of air brakes. Uh, if you have any questions at all, leave a comment down in the comment section there. Leave me a question. Uh, there's lots of information here on the channel about air brakes. There's a playlist called air brakes. We'll give you lots of great information about air brakes if you're going for a CDL license, uh, whether it's tractor trailer, a bus, a truck, or if you've got an air RV unit, you're gonna need an air brake ticket as well. And as of tomorrow, which is 12th of February, 2017, I will have up the air brake course over at my website, which you can go over and you can purchase and have a look at that as well. So I will leave a link for the air brake course down in the description if you're working towards getting your CDL license. So thanks very much for attending, showing up today and giving your time. And if you're thinking about getting a CDL license or you're working towards your commercial driver's license or your air brake ticket, good luck with that. And I'm Rick with Smart Drive Test. Thanks very much for watching. Good luck in your road test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. Bye now.